scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Romans in the 12th chapter. And I'm going to be reading a little bit more than I usually read, um, just because I, I think it helps with the context of where we're going with the message today. And in Romans 12, verses 9 through 21, it says, Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with, with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by this you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome with my evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, there are a few things that I knew as a child. There were a few things I knew never to say. I didn't really know any bad curse words or anything like that when I was young. But my grandmother had a way of saying things like sugar and son of a sea croaker. And although I, and, and the way she said it, it made you think that she said something really bad to you. And although I don't always um, remember everything that she said, I do remember this one day when I did hear uh, a word come out of her mouth, a four letter word. It was one day I heard her use the S word. She said she was upset that my aunt had left the house um, after my grandmother told her not to leave. And my grandmother said, I'm not gonna say the word, I'm just gonna say S. My grandmother said S, and I mean S. <laughs> she wanted us to know she didn't mean sugar this time. She was mad. She really meant the word that came out of her mouth. And I remember getting in trouble as a child because there was a jingle about, I think it was for uh, a beer. And um, it was Black Label, I think was the name of the beer. And I changed the words and called my aunt. I called it, um, I called it Black Doris. And I remember I got so much in trouble for using black as a, as a descriptor for my, my uh, aunt that, you know, as a kid, I didn't realize, but you know, it was bad because it was the mid to early sixties because at that time we weren't considered black or African-American. We were still considered colored and I used the wrong word. You know, it was hard for a child to know what, what was right and what was wrong to say at times. But there was a word I was taught never to say towards another person, and I have always remembered that. We were never to say we hate anybody. No matter what they did, no matter what they said, we were never to use the word hate towards another person. But in a different context, though, hate, is, hate still has a place. The scripture that was read a, little, a few minutes ago was from a communication that Paul sent to the church at Rome. For a bit more background, in the first century, there, was, there were Jewish Christians living in Rome and in around the late, four, late, late 40s in the first century, um, there was some um, civil unrest, some rioting that was going on. Um, and it's thought that it was because of the Christian message that was being preached in Rome. And so Emperor Claudius expelled a number of Christian Jews out of Rome. But then in the year 54 CE, uh, Rome got a new emperor. And so when Nero came in, he rescinded the decree that expelled the Jews and they were able to return. So when they got back to Rome though, it caused some difficulty between the returning Jew Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians and the non-Christians that never left Rome. They weren't happy about this return. So there was a bit of hatred and evil 
that was threatening the community. It was, it was um, to this fragmented and, and um, challenged community that Paul wrote to address these evils that were being perpetuated in the community. Paul wanted to remind them that they were one community, including Jew and Gentile, being led by the Spirit of God and defined by faith, not law. There was no room for hate. You know, hate is a very interesting concept, you know, for those of us who typically don't live in a space of hate, it's sometimes hard to understand why we hate. I was reading something in psychology today and it gave us some ideas as to why people hate. They said, uh, love, number one, it's the fear of the other that causes us to hate. Love for the in-group and hatred and even aggression towards the out-group uh, the group that's been seen as different and dangerous, they are considered a threat to the in-group and that causes fear that causes us to hate. That's the space where much of the racism we see is born. And when you add power to hatred, it often becomes systemic evil. And then there's the fear of self, a rejection of something we don't like about ourselves. When we see the same trait or behavior in someone else that we judge in ourselves and we, we judge them and deem them as unacceptable, that judgment turns into hate. And often that hate results into evil, such as people who kill transgender people and homosexual persons and people who kill people for apparently no reason, when in fact, it probably has something to do that's going on, something that's going on inside of them that they saw that they didn't like. And number three, it's the lack of compassion. Similar to the fear of self, um, if we've not learned to accept and love our whole self, we will attack others in order to defend against the threat we see in ourselves. But if we are whole and okay with ourselves, then we can see difference. And we can see the difference between our stuff and their stuff. But if we're, uh, and, and if we're okay with ourselves, we can show compassion to people rather than evil. Number four, they said, is uh, it, it, fills a, it fills a void. There's this war culture that we live in promotes violence. This competition as a way of life that we live in, that promotes violence. We see vulner vulnerability as a disadvantage, and often that leads to evil as a preemptive strike. Let me destroy you before you destroy me. And that's what I learned from my mama and my, my daddy and all through my history. So this is the way it has to be. I need to hate you. This evil is something you deserve. You know, what we need to do is separate the actions of a person from that person's being. Hate the evil, not the essence of the person. It was Mahatma Gandhi who said, man and his deed are two distinct things. Whereas a good deed should call forth approbation and uh, a wicked deed disapprobation, the doer of the deed, whether good or wicked, always deserves respect or pity as the case may be. Hate the sin and not the sinner is a precept which though easy enough to understand is rarely, rarely practiced. And that's why the poison of hatred, hatred spreads in the world. Some actions are nothing but evil. I believe a person can be a perpetrator of evil, but I do not believe that that person is inherently created as an evil per person. Being a being of light, I cannot tell you how someone can be the source of this level of evils that we've seen historically. And I'm not saying we should excuse it. When I look at the slave trade and I look at the Holocaust, I look at, at, at these levels of evils. When I look at some of the tweets and some of the policy, policy decisions in our country today, it becomes hard not to see individuals as pure evil. They may even be hate-filled themselves, but that does not mean I need to bring myself to drink the same life-destroying poison as to label them, as to hate them and label them as evil. The cost of hate towards another person is too high a price to pay. It was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, returning hate for hate multiplies hate. 
and adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. And then it was Rabbi Jonathan Sachs who said, to be free, you must let go of hate. While you are consumed by hating another, you can never be truly free. Hatred corrupts our individual and collective souls, inevitably overtaking our consciousness and behavior. It prevents us from, per, from pursuing positive goals. You know, just as Paul was attempting to get the community of his time to treat one another with care and respect, even across ethnicities, Jews and Gentiles finding a way to live in harmony, that's still what we need to hear is what Paul was saying to them. He said, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Again, from that article I was reading in Psychology Today, I, I read, most of us lie somewhere between the extremes of Gandhi and Hitler on the spectrum, and the spectrum of human behavior. Sometimes we may behave bad, badly when egocentric in, impulses cause us to put our needs before the welfare of others. Sometimes we behave in saintly fashion when empathy and compassion impels us to put the needs of others before our own resulting in altruism and kindness. And then it was Jane Truslow Adams who said, there is so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us, it ill behooves us, it behooves any of us to find fault in the rest of us. You know, I love the greeting namaste. I love thinking about the divine in me bows to the divine in you. You know, even in the worst of us, at the core of our being, even if it's laying dormant at the time, there is still a possibility for positive change. However, I also have to say that hate has its place. Hate has its place when it comes not to people, but hate has a place when it comes to systems and actions of evil. It was, again, Martin Luther King Jr. who said, he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to per perpetuate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. Evil systems and policies are why Paul is saying, hate what is evil. Hate systemic racism. Hate this idea of pushing people into businesses and schools in the face of a rising illness where there's no cure. Hate the fact that we're ignoring the needs of the poor. Hate the fact that we're taking away health care while COVID is still raging as an evil in this country. In, in these cases, hate has its place because we need something to fuel us to work against injustice. There's an old song recorded by the Persuaders back in 1971. And that song says there's a thin line between love and hate. That song was talking about the results of a cheating lover. But I'm taking the title and twisting the meaning a bit to say there's a thin line between hate and love. Hatred of unjust systems should trigger a love response as we respond, respond with care for ourselves and for our communities. Our activism ought to be driven by love but it may be triggered by hatred of an unjust system. That love response is lived out in a number of ways. Number one, it, it helps us to get to know our neighbors. It's lived out by spending time talking with our friends. It's, it's lived out by starting, starting or participating in peaceful protest. It's showing up as wearing your, your mask and socially distancing no matter what the government is saying or no matter what the government is modeling. It's showing up as connecting with someone you, can, you have considered as the other. It reminds us also to remind others about the importance of voting. It reminds us to vote with our heart and with our conscience. And it reminds us to help when and where we can, regardless of perceived difference. Paul put it this way. He said, no, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. 
If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you'll heap burning coals on their heads. He said, do not, overcome e do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, it's taken me a while, some years, to understand that thing about the heaping burning coals on their head in the scripture. But I get it now. It does not mean you physically burn or injure anybody. It means that your love-driven action may so confound those who would do evil that they would potentially have a change of heart and mind after they witness your, your love and witness how you live. Again, it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. There will still be some people whose actions will continue to be evil. Psychopaths and narcissists will still do evil things. Narcissism, you know, actually is an extreme result of fear and insecurity that cannot stand uh, to own its own flaws. It can't even stand to admit they have flaws. Can't even stand to see they have flaws. For them, the best thing we can do is protect ourselves from their evil and pray that they'll get some help. But if enough of us do, as Paul suggests to the church in Rome, on a grassroots level, we can build a culture of love and care for one another that no one can stop. There is still, my friends, an abundance and powerful thread of lo love that throws from person to person. Paul said, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love to one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Namaste. Thanks for listening. Join us next week at 10 a.m. Eastern Time via Zoom. Send me an email to drkathy100 at gmail.com. That's D-R-K-A-T-H-I 100 at gmail.com. And I'll send you the information so you can join by Zoom. Well, have a great week.